Ernesto Martinez's career has included Veep, Dollface, Physical, and Reunion. And he, he's here now to discuss the excellent Peacock limited series, Fight Night, The Million Dollar Heist. Ernesto, obviously, I, this is such an, I, just from the jump, I feel like such an awesome period uh, to play in and probably to, to design for and costume design for. I think that's evident from your costumes right away. I, I guess just overall in terms of your research, and obviously so many of these people are based on real life figures i guess like where did you start in terms of like your research and how this show should look well you know it, uh, the 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 event takes place in atlanta in the 1970s when muhammad ali came back uh he had a career you know they they gave him his license to fight in america again and you know there's not a lot of fashion um all these people came from all over the world and so i had really free range to design every character in a way that felt like Atlanta, but a very fashionable Atlanta with a lot of money and a lot of gangsters. And so I kind of went out of the box and, you know, decided that each character should come from, you know, different places of the world and, you know, dress very not conventional, what people would think they would dress like in Atlanta in the 1970s, you know, like, I, you know, Samuel L. Jackson, I based on, you know, some kind of banker that I thought would buy his clothes at Savile Row. And, you know, and I made all his wardrobe and I, and I made it look like that. I, you know, went for that kind of look, fine tailoring, you know, beautiful coats and hats and Homburgs and things like that, that were really not, not a look that someone like from Atlanta would have that, although he came from New York City from, you know, uh, so, you know, we kind of had free range on what we wanted to do. Taraji, I based on uh, on a Josephine Baker type of character, you know, how she would have been when she was younger. And, uh, and I looked at some of her photos from the 1970s and she was pretty much the same, pretty risque. Uh, you know, um, Kevin Hart's character, I based on, um, on another movie that I saw that was based in the 70s. I, I did a lot of Shaft type of looks for him. I thought that it would be something that he would look up to. Uh, so stuff like that, yeah. <laughs> and for that then, did you have like for each, like do you have like, as you're doing that, and like that's like really apparent in the show too. And I, I like that about this show. Did you have like, like research books or like, how do you do it? Like, how do you keep track of like how you want, like what you want all these people to be? And are you just pulling in images and like ideas for each of them, like kind of when you're doing it, I guess? You know, it, it kind of becomes that, you know, I asked my assistants to do a deep dive into Google, into, you know, Pinterest and all of that. But I also have a pretty extensive library on 70s and 80s fashion. And there were a lot of like, you know, it was very specific back then in the 70s as far as uh, Black American men uh, for fashion. I don't know if you remember like James Brown and all those kind of crazy jumpsuits they had. There was a company called Prestige. And they sort of ran the whole gamut of these really kind of crazy fashion moments, you know, in history that you'll never see again. But they were very, uh, I, I don't know how I, I, to describe it. It's just they were really far out and out of the box fashion. You could call it glam rock before glam rock became, you know, what it is. Um, the clothes were, you know, for a better word, they looked incredibly gay for straight men, you know, to wear a lot of these stretch fabrics, one piece fabrics, you know, with, you know, all your, your chest is out, your your hair is out. I mean, and, and they took, you know, pride in them. And this was like, you know, conventional straight men who were doing high fashion, the big hats, the whole pimp look, you know, uh, you know, think Dolomite, <laughs> you know. And and it was really something that they um, they aspired to, and 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 that was the look, and so I I kind of tamed that, you know. I mean, I, I I took inspiration from it and then did my own version of it. Yeah, definitely. Watching the show, I'm like, um, it's like a different, much different vibe than now. I feel like, you know, what I mean, like just in terms of everything, it's just the that period is such a great. It's a very fertile time, I guess, for this kind of stuff, right? In the wardrobes. No, it's really funny. And, it, and it's funny that I, uh, it's sort of come full circle. I'm doing a movie right now with Hugh Jackman and I'm just kind of dressing him in that way. You know, Neil Diamond, when I look at the stuff, uh, oh God, did I just do a spoiler? <laughs> but anyway, you know, they, they did a lot of the same things. You know, they just incorporated the same fashion and changed it around a bit yeah. and made it, uh, you know, suit the time and the person. 
you, you mentioned like I, one of the things I noticed right away on the show too is so you have obviously all these main characters, but you're you have to dress seemingly tons of people. I mean, like in the opening scene, there's like a montage of like Kevin Hart's character like going around kind of like the neighborhood basically. And I was like, man, every person here had to be like dressed and like designed for. And it's like you're building out this world so much. And I guess like how complicated is that? And then like, I guess, had you kind of like figure out, are you like just kind of like, uh, how do you like do that? Are you like individually like how should each of these people in the background that maybe have no lines or anything look and just kind of like, how do you kind of make that work, I guess? You know, I can take very little credit for that. I had such a good team behind me and they did my assistant Paula and my wardrobe supervisor, Stephen O did such a great job of doing research. And really we made boards and they stayed very true to all the boards uh, that we, that we uh, you know, comprised with the looks of all the characters, all the day players. Uh, they were all very unique people and they, they had to resonate, you know, whatever line they, you know, whatever dialogue they had, it really had to resonate in their wardrobe. Mm. Uh, it was very important. And so I, I cannot take credit for that. They did that. And well, that's a great team. Awesome. You can take credit for having me on, on the team. It's a good team yeah. that you have there, right? I mean, like. <laughs> Such a great team. Did How much of this was like, vers like, obviously like that period. And like you said, like, I'm sure like those, these clothes are maybe like you, how much of, I guess, are you sourcing versus how much you're actually like recreating or, or just building new, I guess, based on stuff you've seen, like, how did you kind of figure that out? Well, if, if you look at anything that the first, uh, the first five characters are, are, are wearing uh, from number one, two, three, four, five, I made all of that. And then everything else was probably rented or or made like, you know, for very specific characters. But everything that uh, Samuel L. Jackson wore, everything Kevin Hart wore, everything Taraji Henson wore, everything Don Cheadle wore, uh, because they needed multiples in all their wardrobe as well. Um, you know, they had a lot of stand-in photo doubles and things like that, so you can't just use one. And you know, actors are not allowed to share clothing. You know, it's a it's a thing we have in the safety and uh, hygiene. So um, you know, we have to make everything. So so all of the all of their wardrobe was made. And then are you like in that like so I guess like you were saying like Samuel Jackson's character is like got this high like Seville Row type look and like very like kind of you know fancy banker and then like Kevin Hart maybe more uh, that kept more like Shaft or like street level or whatever I guess like. Are you distressing? Like, how like detailed are you? Like, well, this would be like really worn and maybe not as take, not as up, ke not kept up as much. Like Kevin's wardrobe, maybe versus like Samuel's, and how you kind of like are, I guess, thinking about how these clothes have been, like, cared for. I just found all of this like really fascinating. I was like, this is really put a lot of thought into this, basically. Well, like you know, I like uh, like all of Samuel Jackson's clothes. I thought was all new. I thought he would, he would change his wardrobe every two years. And he would just buy new suits and new clothes because things went out of fashion. Uh, Kevin Hart's, I thought he would own every, he would have owned any everything for five years. And I had them distressed and even started out making, I would age the fabric before I even started making the clothing so that it looked like it had five or 10 years wear, you know, worth of wear on it. And, you know, we put the rips and tears and little scratches and, you know, he wore a lot of leather. So the leather was tooled and, worn and it looks really organic to him. I think they did a really good job. I have a, a guy named Jonathan Logan who did all the leather work and he's out of Los Angeles and he did a great job for me and I'm very grateful. <laughs> but, yeah. That's awesome. Do you, we, one of the characters we didn't mention, I guess, was uh, uh, Terrence Howard, I think plays uh, Cadillac Richie, right? Uh, which is a great, <laughs> another, just everything about his look is fantastic. Obviously the clothes, the hair, obviously, <laughs> I just think it's like a great look. Uh, I guess, can you talk a little about that character, like kind of your inspirations there, I guess, and, you know, making him pop so much on the show? I, well, you know, I, I went to Superfly, you know, the classic, and then I just tamed it down a little bit for, for Terrence because he was going to do this. He showed me his wig. And I, you know, I said, oh, it's Farrah Fawcett. <laughs> and we started, started playing with it. I said, well, I'll have to calm down, you know, the colors and, you know, make it a little bit more tame so that the hair and the makeup would really stand out because he really wanted that to, you know, to resonate as the character. And it does, it really, you know, like he looks great in that. No one could pull that off. I didn't think James Brown would have had a, a wig like that, you know, back then. And um, so, you know, I made all his clothes, you know, based on that, um, the colors, you know, like really not too bold a color, but uh, something 
to that would also compliment uh, Frank that he was in in every scene with. So he couldn't look too ridiculous, uh, you know, next to Frank. And um, so, you know, that's that's how we did that. I, I kind of color, color coordinated their their wardrobe versus the sets versus each other, um, you know, because there were like four of them that hang out together all the time. And so it was kind of tricky, but it was fun. Yeah, I think I think the fun comes through. I think the show is really great. And like your work is amazing. Ernesto Martinez, uh, Fight Night, The Million Dollar Heist. You can watch the episodes on Peacock. Thank you, uh, Ernesto. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Luca Mosca's career has included Paranoia, John Wick, The Last Witch Hunter, and Skyscraper, but he's here now to talk about the incredible uh, Amazon Prime Video series, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. Uh, Luke, I know you worked on on season one, but you took over as the, the main costume designer here for season two fully. I guess, just what were your goals, I guess, going into season two and kind of like how to expand like what has been set up while also introducing a lot of new people and characters, I guess, like kind of overall, like 30,000 foot view, what were you hoping for here for this season? Uh, well, I had the great uh, advantage of going into season two uh, with the language uh, that had already been established and with a uh, absolutely uh, fabulous season one. So I could only build upon that and just add and make it better if it uh, was in any way possible. So I thought that I came from a place of real um, advantage. And then what we wanted to do in season two is explore more uh, treatments and expand each uh, civilization and community um, into uh, like for a broader uh, scope, like say orcs, we were able to um, to add a lot of more um, armor details and helmets and stuff because we had the luxury of being able to sculpt them and make uh, brand new armor. Uh, we, for the elves, uh, we also had to build a brand new uh, army of people. And so um, coming up with uh, concepts for uh, chest plates, cuirasses and uh, helmets and um, and all the bits. So um, I think that season two was really about um, expanding, uh, making better, and uh, keeping the language and the uh, the the grammar that we had, but just um, um, adding on. You have mentioned like all these like different uh, like the build and stuff of the armor and like to so the orcs and elves. I guess like how much like on a typical thing like that. Like how does that. Like, I guess quick, I guess kind of quickly, because we all know the time, but how does that like work from like designing to executing, like to building that all out and making it at scale, I'd imagine, because you have so many, it just feels like a show where there's just a lot of, you know, there's a lot of background actors and like all these different things that you have to dress and make look like as right, good right, as right. anything else, right? Yeah. So, talking about armor, um, it's something that my excellent colleagues, uh, um, Neger and Ernesto will uh, relate to. When you pull the trigger on something big and there's no way of returning, uh, that's a that's a major heart attack central. So with the with the armor, you have to design, do concept design it to illustrate it. And then when it's, once it's approved by the studio, by the showrunners, by everybody, then you say, it's a go. And your armorer says, are you sure? And at that point, you lie because you say, yes, I'm sure. But you're never sure because you would like to go back and change it. So uh, every every bit, you know, for the, for the army, you make it small and a large, and you make all the pieces you you sculpt them, you mold them, and you make them in multiples. And we had uh, um, hundreds uh, of pieces. And um, and uh, so then it needs to be painted, it needs to be broken down, it needs to be made uh, wearable. So in, in the particular case of armor, it's really like, uh, how can you be at a point where where you can say yes, go, but that moment has to be reached because there is a five months lead time to make your uh, pieces a lot easier when you deal with fabric and you sew something because if it doesn't work, you can always remake it. But again, it's 
probably custom dyed, custom embroidered and distressed. So um, it's about um, really being very organized, getting uh, approvals from the powers to be and uh, and just doing it and trying to stay uh, within the uh, parameters of uh, timing, uh, which is the most important thing, obviously. You, we mentioned like season two, obviously there's some new characters, obviously like it's, uh, Tom Pompadil being added to the show and obviously a character that I think a lot of Tolkien fans have wanted to see on screen and never, not in any of the Lord of the Rings films, obviously that we've seen prior. So I guess like, what was like, not like the pressure of that, but like, how did you kind of like think, like getting to introduce this character, I guess, and how it's going to look? Like, well, I guess, how did that, like, yeah, go ahead, like, what was that no, like? no, no, uh, the, the pressure is huge because, um, you know, I've read the books, I know, I know the story, I know the lore, but I know that there is an army of people out there, of viewers, who have a far deeper knowledge than myself in this incredible world of Tolkien. And so it's very intimidating. So you take uh, Tom Bombadil, which is so iconic, and you have yellow boots and a blue coat and the specifics even about the feather. Tolkien never gives you so many details. And so how do you put Tom Bombadil in front of the camera without giving out that he is Tom Bombadil immediately? So working on the tone of yellow boots. So we had 20 pairs, uh, 20, 20 swatches of uh, yellow leather um, in order to choose the perfect one in how to work the, the blue coat. Or maybe we start the first scene without a coat and uh, and without a hat so you you get to realize who he is but um it's definitely a lot of pressure when you when you introduce for the first time a character who is uh, so well known and so iconic what a responsibility hopefully he it's it's been well received I think it has. No, I do. I think it has. Yeah. I, I think the yeah. fans are really excited about that. You mentioned, like, I mean, we don't need to spoil, but obviously, like, there's another character, uh, the stranger, like, that ties into a character who's familiar, I think, to Lord yeah. of the Rings fans, obviously. And I guess, like, in terms of the costuming of that character, had it, were there, did you try to, like, in, did you try to seed maybe things in the costume that would allow people, if they go back and watch, to be like, oh, like, yes, I could see that and how they're dressed or how they're kind of like costumed, I guess. Well, um, I cannot take ownership of the stranger because that was a season one character and his costume just evolved within the same uh, um, costume. It just shrunk up in proportion and it became more elegant, more elven in order to become from the stranger to the grand elf, right? That's a play on words. And so a uh, big bow at the genius of Kate Holly, who was uh, my uh, the previous designer, the one before me. And um, I'm incredible her choice of fabric, uh, choosing this raw silk that looks like a burlap, very heavy, but very drapey. And that lends itself so well to distressing and aging and taking dyes. And um, and yeah, putting the seeds, what I did with The Stranger is just re-elaborate on the costume and reduce the volume and making it from a from an oversized drapey sack into something uh, that throughout the season became smaller and taller and longer and um, to eventually become uh, the look of a wizard of a grand elf. Of Gandalf. Yes. <laughs> Do you have like, I mean, like, this is obviously the show is so like, it just, it seems like a huge accomplishment. I don't know, like, again, if you watch the show, it's like, oh my God, how is this? Like, how did you, how did they all pull this off? I guess you have something like this season, like what was your, what were you most proud of having been able to execute and like kind of succeed throughout the season, I guess? Uh, it's almost like you're asking a parent here to choose yes. his favorite children, right? His favorite yes. So the parent will lie and say, oh, I like all my children all the same. And we know that it is not the same. So I'm not going to pick a favorite, but I can tell you that when I was working in Numenor, for example, uh, on our Farazon or the Queen Muriel, um, I don't know, to me, it felt like 
it felt like um, Atlantis at the peak. It, it felt like the Roman Empire on the very last day of grandeur and decadence before the fall. And uh, so all these rich, shiny, primary colors, jewel tone, um, brocades and embroideries. That's what I really related to. And also being the race human, maybe made me relate to it even more. It's it's a lot easier for me to relate to a human concept than to a eight foot tall elf or a four foot tall, three foot tall dwarf. So Numenor is just an example, but we we had in, you know, um, my colleague Ernesto just said something very beautiful that I that I totally identify with. I cannot take credit for that. And uh, I feel like in these whole series, I can take very little credit because every bit was um, made died, broken down, illustrated, concepted, sculpted by someone else who is better than me at doing that uh, because that's what they do. And um, and so, yeah, I'm here taking accolades for a huge um, uh, undertaking, a huge endeavor, but that was mine only up to a point. It was really... It really took um, a village and an army mm. of great uh, workers around me, of great assistants, stitchers, cutters, embroiderers, leather workers, 3D printers, uh, smith, forgers, uh, you name it. God knows how many I'm forgetting now. Uh, it was incredible. It was a huge operation. And it was, a, I'd say, a huge success as a, as a fan of the show. Uh, Aluga Mosca, uh, Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. Uh, you can watch all the episodes on Amazon. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Appreciate it. Thank you. Nagar Ali Klein's career has included Here Comes the Night, Life After Beth, Land of Dreams, and All-American. But she hears, she's here now to talk about the smash hit Netflix series, Nobody Wants This. Uh, just, I guess, starting off, a contemporary series set in Los Angeles about ostensibly very cool people, cooler certainly than me as a viewer. Uh, what were your main goals in like costuming the show and like kind of like overall, like what were your initial goals, I guess? Hi, yes. So I had heard about this project. I I had read about um, Aaron Foster uh, making, you know, creating this show that was originally called Shiksa. And um, I just thought that was such a, you know, sort of great, brilliant concept. So I reached out to one of the producers and uh, they sent me the script and I read the script and just connected to it immediately. I mean, I felt, you know, like I had to do this project, which is very rare. I mean, I don't know that I've ever felt like that actually, um, having read something. So I, you know, prepared the boards and asked for a meeting and, um, and we, had a you know really great first meeting where it was pretty obvious that Aaron and I shared a lot of the same references and that we were you know very aligned in the way that we saw these characters. Um, for me, I grew up in LA. I knew this world so well. I knew these characters just they just jumped off the page for me. Not just Joanne and Morgan, but really all of the characters: Noah's family, Bina. Um, Noah's brother Sasha. I I felt like I had you know people in my life that you know that were very similar. So I really you know my inspiration was LA, and I wanted to show LA in a very authentic way. Um, and so that was I would say definitely a goal at the very beginning, starting off. So then how did, did you show L.A. in an authentic way? Because I feel like it does. I, I'm, not, I'm in New York, so I don't know. But it felt very authentically L.A. And I guess how did you kind of pull that off in the in the costumes and, and their wardrobe and stuff? Yeah, well, the inspiration, I mean, it was like my, you know, my friends, um, family members, um, you know, Noah's family. They're immigrants from Russia. I'm very familiar with the sort of immigrant culture here in L.A., being Iranian and Armenian. Um, and so I really just 
drew inspiration from people around me. Um, I included a lot of LA designers when I was, you know, putting together the looks, especially for Morgan and Joanne. Um, and, you know, we, we definitely had some like little moments of like, like the Casa Vega t-shirt, where if you are from LA or have spent time here, you know that that's a restaurant in Studio City where, you know, most people are familiar with um, that live here. So yeah, using a lot of LA designers and sort of basing it on people that I knew. So with like Joanne, obviously it's based yeah. on Erin, like as the character, right? And then also you have, so you have, I guess I was thinking this, like you have, Erin has her own style, right? Very fashionable, probably in real life, obviously. Uh, Kristen Bell has her own style. And then the character has to have her own style. And I guess, how did you kind of blend all of that together, I guess, and think about it? I guess like how much of it is like, oh, we just want to be like, like we should make Kristen, Kristen look like Erin here or like, no, Joanne would wear this even if Kristen and Erin wouldn't, I guess, like that kind of thing. Yeah, that was that was definitely um, something that we were always trying to, you know, reconcile. Um, yeah, since this was based on Aaron's life, it was though the costumes weren't exactly what something Aaron would wear. Um, they had the spirit, I feel right. So they definitely it was, you know, through her point of view, um, the entire world and. With Kristen, I mean, she's so collaborative. She has amazing instincts, truly. I mean, in every single fitting, she would come in and knew exactly what would work for her character. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we kind of drew from Kristen's, you know, she had input and certainly Aaron had input. Um, but both of them were very open also, you know, to allowing me to pull in designers and brands that, you know, maybe they weren't familiar with and, um, and so we kind of created it together, really. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. I want to ask too about Noah's look, obviously, Adam. Love Adam Brody. Always loved him since the OC. So he looks great. And I just, I guess I was like, had, the character is like the hot rabbi. So I'm like, that's like a high bar, I guess, in somebody's head. Played by Adam Brody, very handsome man. How did you kind of like think about like what the hot rabbi would look like and how aware would he be of his own wardrobe, I guess? Like how important are clothes to that character or like how he looks, I guess, like in terms of like what he's dressing as day to day? Like, how'd you kind of think about that? Well, I don't think fashion was important for Noah, right? Like he wasn't trying to make a fashion statement, but I think what was important to him were sort of, you know, that the pieces were um, classic and, you know, of quality. Like a lot of the fabrics that we used for him were you know, like beautiful cashmeres and wools, like organic fabrics, honest fabrics. Um, I sort of set out with a color palette for Noah and his family versus Joanne and her world. Uh, so Noah's world was sort of, you know, uh, jewel tones. And um, we used this like red throughout like this maroon rather throughout um, his world and his family. And we also spoke a lot with a rabbi leader who is a former rabbi of Wilshire Temple here in LA and sort of, you know, chatted with him about, we just wanted to make sure that we got all the sort of nuanced things right with his character and made sure those were correct in terms of when he's um, addressing his congregation, when he would be wearing a tallit, when he would not be wearing one. Or, I mean, very early on, we actually had, um, in one of the scripts, we had a shiva um, that later didn't make it in, but uh, you know, thinking about that scene, we want to make sure that we got all of those, you know, pieces correct in terms of, um, you know, you know, all the cultural things. So we had Rabbi Leader to guide us, which was really helpful. You mentioned the cultural things. That's another thing I think. And, and I think Aaron's talking about this, how it's like showing like a, a modern spin on Judaism that maybe is not familiar to people watching, like who are watching, right? Like, or like maybe haven't been exposed to the, the culture as much as maybe they should have. I guess like how did, so how much care did you take to in terms of that, like with the whole community, not just like with Noah and stuff, but like with the, the background actors and all these different things, like especially in those temple scenes or like at the bat mitzvah, like how much care did you think about like how you're dressing all those people to make it feel like truthful to the community, I guess? Oh, so much. I mean, the funny thing about this was like, or like the ironic thing was my son just turned 13 last year. And at the same time, he was, you know, on his bar bat mitzvah circuit, we were filming, um, you know, nobody wants this. And so I was, you know, dropping him off at these bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, and just like looking at what all the girls were wearing and what, you know, the parents were wearing so that I could just do my research there. So it was really, I mean, it was so nice to have that actually. <laughs> um, so yes, we took, you know, a lot of care and, you know, there, there are different things about being, um, 
Russian and Jewish versus American and Jewish. And so we wanted to make sure that we incorporated all those sort of sub subtle things with Noah's family. Um, and yeah, I think we tried to be as authentic as possible, you know, um, given the sort of like, as Luca said, time parameters and all the rest. But yeah, very mindful of that. You, you mentioned, I love the Bamitsu too, because I think that Miriam's custom t-shirt, I just love pizza, apple, Jewish star equal Miriam. I just thought That's that was right. the best. <laughs> it's just hilarious. I thought well, the hoodie, I mean, the <laughs> hoodie is like the, you know, that is just the thing at all the bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, the customized hoodie. So we had to make sure to have that because that is very much, that is very much a thing. Um, and yeah, Miriam's uh, dress. I mean, that was really fun to make. That was a piece that I custom made for the show. And also um, Morgan's dress for that uh, episode was something that I made. So I always love an opportunity to custom make something, you know, for a contemporary show that's that's not as frequent. But yeah, it was fun to do. Very fun to watch as well. I guess I want to ask you, you mentioned Sasha before. His looks are just the best. I think they're just so, uh, so unique, I guess would be the description I would use. Yeah. Uh, how, did you, like, how did you think of him overall? And his his style is just... It, I, it was like, oh, I've never seen anything like this. Basically, I don't even know. I was like, oh my God, this oh, is whole so thing funny. Great. So I guess, how'd you kind of think about him as a character? Well, yeah, I mean, I knew, th I know this guy, right? And I, well, so there's a casualness that's sort of like, you know, is just very, you know, uh, it, 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 in LA, there's like a casualness that permeates menswear, right? So a lot of, you'll see guys wearing hoodies or sneakers, but these hoodies cost, like, they're very expensive. You know, they're wearing, like, um, not quite hype beast, right? Like these limited edition sneakers or, um, uh, you know, just very expensive fleece pullovers. Um, and so we sort of thought of him like that. I mean, he's kind of like a bit of a man child, right? He's kind of in his brother's shadow. Um, he sort of talks a lot throughout the season about like, let's go take a gummy, a, a, a weed gummy. Or so we wanted him to have this sort of like playfulness in his wardrobe as well. Um, and so, yeah, we kind of went to these streetwear brands for him and I thought it worked so well. I mean, Tim was such a good sport about it. He came in, I don't know what he expected in his first fitting, but we had just like a rack of, you know, these oversized um, hoodies and bright sweaters and Stone Island cargo pants. And he just immediately got it. And he was such a fun actor to work with um, because he just totally embodied that, you know, that character so well. Um, so he was really fun to, you know, sort of, put together yeah i also wonder if it helps because he's so tall he's just yeah. a big he looks so big on screen yeah. anywhere and he's well ernesto right? knows yeah <laughs> he's yeah he's quite tall um yeah. and you know and and he came in, in that first fitting he came in with his own beanie we just thought that was so great for the character so we kind of kept that throughout um yeah he's he's quite tall and, and that's why i think he kind of looks kind of those clothes suit him well too you mm -hmm. know so that ended up working out really nicely. Yeah, I think so. And uh, I guess so, before, like, coming back for season two, already can't wait. Watch, like, burn through the whole episodes. I'm like, can't wait for season two. I guess, have you already started thinking about, like, where things might go in season two and, like, what you're hoping to do? Yes, I am thinking about things already, right? I mean, we're the thing about Joanne, for me, was that I really wanted to hone her personal style, right? So she has this flexibility in her style, and she kind of dresses differently for the different environments that she finds herself in. Um, or the different situations rather that she finds herself in, but she has a very distinct personal style, right? As most women do at that age and stage of their lives, they've kind of have their uniform down. Uh, they know what they like, they know who they are, and they know how they want to sort of present themselves to the world. Um, so it will, it's not going to shift dramatically. I mean, of course, we don't know what she's going to be going through in season two, but, you know, I can't imagine that her style is going to shift dramatically, but, um, yeah, definitely thinking about what what she'll be getting into for season two. Nice. Uh, Nigar Ali Klein, costume designer for Nobody Wants This. You can watch all the episodes on Netflix. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ernesto Martinez, costume designer for Fight Night, The Million Dollar Heist. Luca Mosca, costume designer for The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. And Nigar Ali Klein, costume designer for Nobody Wants This. Ernesto, right. we didn't get a okay. chance. We we had a little 10-minute chat before 
Uh, so uh, Nigar and I have an advantage over you. But, um, <laughs> I wanted to say uh, congratulations for your fabulous show. It is a feast for the eyes and it was beautiful to listen to your interview and go and, you know, just hearing it from you. It was fantastic. Every single piece. It was really beautiful. That well is done. So kind, so kind of you. Thank you. And I the same to both of you. I mean, <laughs> I, I saw both your shows and they're really hard work. You know, I can't imagine working with all the, the tooling that you have to do on armor and uh. You, know, you have a lot of uh, a lot of background as well that is incredible on on rings of power. It's it rings of power, is it right? Rings of power, yeah. Uh, but Ernesto, you have so many people doing the work. It's almost like when you described so well your feeling of gratitude for people who dress the background in the street and they do it so well. On some level. When I go to set and I see all this background, I have the same feeling because Anya Jane Maggi, she's um, she's the background designer, really. And she does all this excellent work. And you go to set and you see all the magic that someone else has done. So it just, um, yes, it is a large show, but with a large amount of people who um, do the work, who take the lead and uh so it's uh, it's more of a, at this point, it was more of a creative director position where you had to say yes or no to things because someone else was doing them. So, yeah. And it all, they also give you the scale. The scale yeah. of everything is really the, the background, you know? It, it makes everything so much yeah, better. Yeah, yeah. And you, you... You use the word scale, and also Chris, you used the word scale before. Um, but scale is something that we do, uh, meaning if you have an elf, you do the costume for the human, and then you hire a giant, literally, somebody who is seven foot five. And so you have to scale in proportion the costume. So you have to make a print which is 45% larger uh, to be on that costume. Or if you have a dwarf, you do the same thing and you scale it down. So when you guys use the word scale, I got PTSD because I remember how difficult that was. But again, there's people there with calculators and everything that shrink everything or enlarge everything to in order to make it up to scale. Maybe that's one of the most difficult things that were done on Rings of Power. Mm -hmm. Do you guys like have you guys talking about this? Do you guys all are you watch like you're watching the other people like when you're watching shows, are you like noticing these kind of things as costume designers? Like and how much work goes into everything? Like on all of your shows are obviously different. Like you have a, a contemporary show, a period show, a big epic fantasy show, but are you guys like yeah, are you noticing these things and knowing how difficult it is to do this at, at this level? I, I get anxiety. I get anxiety from looking at my uh, colleagues' work mm -hmm. uh, because I know how how much has gone into that. And I know exactly what the struggles were, uh, where their successes are, and how good they have been in achieving all of that. Uh, when, I, when I saw Niger's work at Nesto's work, immediately like anxiety anxiety central because i know exactly and so i cannot watch a movie or a tv series like a normal audience because i know exactly i know what the costumes are i know what the camera is i know what the drama is i know what the trucks are there's too much i get too involved ernesto you agree with that yeah i you know i okay so <laughs> full disclosure I watch everything. <laughs> I watch everything. And I really watch things that I think are going to be interesting. So I've seen, you know, your work on um, with Kristen Bell. I've seen your work and I and I because I enjoy these shows on a personal level. So I really look at the costumes. And um, so I know the work and, it, and it's been great. You know, both of you are, like do fantastic work. I saw all the subtleties in the rabbi because I, I kept wondering, how is she going to make this guy really sexy and cute? And you did a great job. And your work is like, you know, the, the action and the, 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 the you know, just like the scale of 
what you do and the green screen. I know that they do AI and they multiply, you know, all these characters, you know, but it's still uh, amazing. And the aging on the, on the work is fantastic. You know, your, your BG person is really great. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I watch everything and I judge everything. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. So but I'm you being know, really honest. <laughs> Ernesto, at this point, when I see a bad costume, I used to say, oh, that costume designer. Now I said, that poor costume designer. See what they put her or him into the condition of doing. I'm no longer blaming the costume designer. I know that there's been an army of chefs in that kitchen yeah. who led to that specific costume. Yeah. Right. yeah. Because you understand yeah. what's going on behind, yeah, you know, what's, totally. what the process totally. is like and and what the costume designer is up against oftentimes. Yeah. Um conversely, I you know, I watched a couple of scenes early on and when you see something in your own work where you're like, oh, that was a bit of a mistake. And then you know, people on your team say, well, no one's going to notice. No one's going to notice that. No, the audience doesn't look for that. And I was like, no, but my peers are going to notice because yeah. that's what they are. That's the, they have trained eyes and they will see that. Um, and obviously, you know, you care about, you know, what your friends, what your friends think. So yeah, very much so. I mean, you watch these shows and you're just like, my mind is blown as to how you wrapped your arms around a project like this and reined it in. It's just so massive. Um, both of you, you know, to to just do all of this custom work is just, I know what goes into it. So I'm incredibly impressed and admire you both so much. Luke, I think you, oh, go ahead, Luke. Sorry. No. Go ahead. Can we all agree, uh, Ernesto and Niger, that continuity is the biggest nightmare of our profession. <laughs> yeah. It's so, so hard. I, I kind of learned that from the beginning. So like, as soon as I, whatever I have in my hands, I make for whatever it is I'm holding. If I have 10 scripts, I'm going to do 10 episodes. That's it. Like, you know, it's just going to yeah. happen up front. You never know, especially when they cross board, what they're going to pull. So you right. have to be right. ready for everything. And I, I kind of like making things now, you know, I used to shop a lot. Now, even on modern, like modern things, mm -hmm. I'm making um, a lot of the wardrobe. It's just become, because of the lack of um, inventory in the stores yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, you must have run into that like horrendously on your show. Oh, it's getting harder and harder. I mean, yeah. you, guys know, every, you know, it's just getting harder and harder to source things. Um, and in, in, in the time that you need it too. So yes, oftentimes doing it custom really is the only way to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's an easier and you get what you yeah. want, but it, you know, and, 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 and the time, you know, I have really good people here. You might, we must all use the same people because mm -hmm. it's only a handful that are like really great, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, you know, always have somebody in-house one or two that just do everything in-house, but the builders we have here are, you know, great. So I'm back to that. <laughs> but, right. You know, it's it's just become a lot easier to build than to shop, even. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of sad. Luke, I think you mentioned this, and, and maybe Ernesto too. I think well, you talked about the the importance of having a great team too. I guess right, like in your your whole their whole department that you're working with. How do you guys like kind of like decide? Like, what do you look for when you're building out your team for these projects? And like, kind of like, how do you like? What are you looking for from the, the people who you're going to be in the trenches with on these shows? Well, in the trenches is a really good way of putting it because that's exactly what it feels like. You know, you're, you're just in it together and you're um, you spend every day together, like 12, 14 hours, oftentimes, sometimes more. And your team is everything. I mean, it's just everything. And I was so lucky to have such a great team because not only were they hardworking and so good at what they do, um, they were fun. You know, you just, it's also like a personality thing. You know, you spend so much time together and you want to just be around people that have great energy and, um, you know, bring, bring that to the table as well. So yeah, I mean, the t the team is everything. I mean, I can't overstate that enough. You know, I got to tell you that, um, and still, I've been doing this a long time. I'm probably older than everybody here, but I um, I still can't believe that they pay me to do what I do. 
<laughs> like every job I get, and I, I'm doing one now that is like pretty incredible. And um, and I always like at the end of a fitting or I'm at the end of a good, you know, a good fitting with an actor, you know, whatever. And you look at their work and you think, wow, I'm, get, I'm working with this guy or this girl. And, you know, we have this rapport and um, and I go and I'm getting paid for it. They're, but, but they're so they, they, they must be out of their minds. <laughs> they had, it's like a mistake. Right. Like this mm -hmm. can't be real. And it's still 30 years later and I still feel the same way. Mm -hmm. So for me, if my team always, they always seem to have the same feeling that I do about being and just doing what we do. And I'm mm -hmm. just grateful to to be here and to, to be doing this. You know, there's not a lot of places in the world that get to do what we do mm -hmm. on, on this level and on this kind of scale. And to meet interesting people all the time and creative people. And I just feel very fortunate. And I don't know, do you guys feel the same? Oh, I, do. <laughs> I do, yes, very much so. Very grateful. Yes, I still, I mean, all these years and I still love what I do, you know? It's yeah. just, it, it's, a, it's a great feeling to be able to say that. Like, I love my work. I love telling these stories. I love collaborating with, you know, other creative people. And it's, yes, I couldn't, yes, I agree with you 100%. And, 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 I, and, I, and I say that because I feel that the crew that you have mm -hmm. and that you get along with, they also feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, my assistants and my wardrobe supervisors are always like, oh my God, I can't believe we're getting paid to do this. <laughs> <laughs> They're crazy. <laughs> yeah. For me, uh, talking about team qualities, um, the absolutely most important thing, even before skills, is really the level of personality. And like you said, you live 12, 14 hours together, sometimes together in a truck. So there's no, like you're really elbow to elbow. And it's so important that people have the same I'm all as you do, and there's not really much room for attitude or bad behavior because then, then it becomes really hard. And one thing that you said, Ernesto, the the level of like almost bewilderment of being with the most skilled craftsmen in America, in the country, in the city where you are, mm -hmm. and not just uh, from from the costume point of view, but the level of those camera people, lighting people, or uh, production designers, uh, set designers, it's, it's just incredible. So on top of working with wonderful people, we also get the privilege of being working with the most uh, gifted minds in the industry. So that's really stimulating. And I think that it makes us better people ourselves just by osmosis. Mm. Just by association. <laughs> by association, a good association. How about working with actors and stuff? Obviously you guys all are working with like really talented actors and like, I'm sure like it depends on the project obviously, but like, like we're in the car, like you were saying, like obviously Kristen Bell is going to have like her own style and stuff maybe or whatever. Like, how do you kind of like, work with them and like what kind of collaboration are you looking for i'm sure some actors that you've worked with in the past are way more into this right than others i would imagine right or maybe they like are they so i guess like yeah how do you kind of work with them and individualize it to make sure each performer is feeling like valued i guess in terms of their costumes you know yeah i mean i think my background in fashion styling really helps with that you know in terms of like working with actors in a, in a very intimate way um I really take the cue from the actor, right? So the the way that the fitting is going to go and sort of the, whether or not we're going to have, I mean, honestly, it comes down to even if we're going to have like small talk or not, like I let them set the tone of how they want to, you know, just the vibe of the fitting, if you will. Um, I mean, I go in extremely prepared. I mean, I have a very, like, I know exactly what I would like them to wear for every scene. And that's all sort of, decided beforehand. So I go in with loads of ideas, but then at the same time, I'm very open to hear their ideas because ultimately Kristen has to wear that costume and perform in that costume. And she knows better than anyone what's going to feel right to her um, 
in that scene and in that moment. So in that sense, it's very collaborative and I'm very open and happy to listen. Like Adam had a lot of, you know, opinions very early on about how he wanted to approach his character. And I love that, you know, I want to take all that in um, and sort of synthesize it and then kind of interpret it in the way that I think, you know, um, in the way that I think. So yeah, I think it's, it's different with every single actor, right? So I try to just kind of and, and that's where we're therapists and psychologists and we sort of like intuit what they want and how they want to, you know, how we want to address this and go from there. Ernesto, how about you? Obviously, with a lot of big, big names on, on, on Fight Night, for sure. Yeah, you know, I've worked with a lot of people and I totally agree with you. You know, I, I do the same as you. I, I like depending on the level of the talent, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm going to treat Hugh Jackman differently than I'm going to treat Sam Jackson, you know, um, but I will definitely let them take the lead in the fitting. I know that I've come in and I've, 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 you know, set a tone. I've done sketches. I've done all of that. But all of that can go right out the window if the character, if the person or the actor does not feel comfortable in what it is, you know, um, you know, they get the boards ahead. They get the designs ahead. And it can all be, um, yeah, sure. I love it. I love it. I love it. And when we get to the actual process and the actual build, it doesn't work. And, you know, you just have to start from scratch. And it's, you know, and you can't push your ideas mm -hmm. uh, and the studio's ideas on, on an individual. You know, it really, you really have to be collaborative and you have to stay open and willing to change whatever you know, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it's it's really not my movie. You know, it is a studio movie, or and and that's where you know, that's that's how you take your cue. You know, what's going to work for the actor, and and most most seasoned actors really do know what looks good on them, what's mm -hmm. going to work for them, how they're going to you know how they're going to perform in it, whether it's singing, whether it's action. You know, things have very different needs. You know, costumes are costumes. And they all have such different needs, you know, right now I'm doing a musical and it's like crazy, like yeah. nothing I've ever done. So, you know, and I'm, it's a learning process. I'm like, wow, well, how did I get this? And it's, <laughs> it's hard, you know, like, you know, I'm learning as I go along, you know, oh, sequence don't stretch. Okay. Oh, they do stretch. <laughs> you know, um, that type of stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Luca, how about you? I'm obviously like Lord of the Rings, there's maybe less flexibility for the actor to have their own input, but at the same time, I'm sure you have to make them feel comfortable and like get them maybe to understand their character in a way that maybe they didn't previously, right? With the costumes, is that right? Yes, it is right. And one thing that I would like to add to the wonderful um, thoughts from Negar and Ernesto is that when I am in a fitting room, I I had the, the uh, responsibility, the duty to acknowledge that an actor is vulnerable in front of us because you ask the actor to undress, you see the actor with all the, all the physical flaws, if you want to call them such, you measure the actor. So um, it's, a, it's a very delicate moment for an actor. So I want to be extremely mindful of that because it's easy to be there in your beautiful outfit my outfit and uh, and say no put this on and uh, and just go for it but no it's not that evident it's a moment of great vulnerability for the actor so um i think that we are all mindful this is what ernesto was explaining as well and nagar and uh, it is not our movie at the end of the day it is someone else's project and we are not painters in a room by ourselves but it's uh, teamwork Mm -hmm. and um, yeah. we have to listen and I loved how you called yourself Nagar a psychologist because I feel like we do a little bit of therapy in there as well or definitely our intuitive pointy caps are worn all the time uh, because we need to anticipate we need to understand we need it's a ballet when we get into that fitting room we are performers psychologists costume designers but as you can see, I put our profession as the last mm -hmm. um, of, the, of the skills. Yeah. Psychics. 
Yeah, Not exactly. behind craft service. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah exactly. uh, we, we could probably keep doing this for another hour, but we do have to wrap up there. This is so much fun, but I just want to thank you all again. Ernesto Martinez, show is Fight Night, The Million Dollar Heist. You can watch those episodes on Peacock, Luca Mosca, The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, all those episodes on Amazon. And, and Nagar Ali Klein, Nobody Wants This, the great uh, comedy series on Netflix, all episodes streaming there. Thank you all so much for doing this. It was really great hearing you talk to each other about this profession. It was so much fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Really, really a privilege. Thank you. Thank Likewise, you. Likewise, Ernesto, Nagar, and Chris. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. It was great. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.